Hey, everybody, we are live. Welcome back. And uh, thank everybody who uh, tuned in earlier to watch uh, my interview with Lee Steinberg and the news that he broke about, uh, well, the response to Tua Tagliabue's uh, reported 13 on the window lick where Lee said, hey, we screen for bright candidates and he's a really bright guy. So there you go. I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce my longtime friend and uh, former business partner, Sports Business Simulations, who is Dan Rasher, the longtime director of academic programs at the University of San Francisco, and also founder of Sports Economics Consulting Firm, as well as his new consulting firm. Dan, can you say that firm? Because I don't want to mess up the name. Um, OSKR. And we've been around since 2008, so we're not as new as we used to be. Yeah, so OSKR, thank you. And Dan, and I'm calling an audible right at this point because Dan is an expert witness in matters regarding sport, business, sports, antitrust. Um, at the hearing, which is on Zoom, the publicly presented hearing on the motion to dismiss the city of Oakland's lawsuit against the NFL in the city of Oakland, there was one professor's name and one professor's name that was brought up by Bruce Simon representing the city of Oakland, and it was Rasher. This man, Dan Rasher. So, Dan, can you tell us what that study is? And first, welcome to the show. It's your first time. And, you know, you think as long as we've known each other, I'd have done this earlier, right? <laughs> but hey, first... you know, thanks for having me. I know exactly. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I feel like we did something like this maybe over a decade ago, but it was probably a different show. That yeah, you... that's right. We did. It was a different format. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a different format. But um, yeah, no, thanks for having me. This is exciting. Um, and I didn't even realize that there was the hearing was this morning um, on the, the city of Oakland versus the NFL and the Raiders because I had done some work on that case and basically handed it off to the attorneys and I, I've been busy doing, doing other things. And so, yeah, that's a really interesting um, case. It sounds like this morning the judge didn't make any rulings. It sounds like he just heard both parties kind of make their case. Um, yeah, and so the, if you want me to tell you about the work that I did, I'm happy to do so. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so one, one of the questions that was on the table was um, the viability of Oakland as an NFL market. And so one of the theories is that if the, if the NFL didn't restrict the number of teams in the market, you know, in the United States as it does, and if the the, the city can prove that that's an anti-competitive or, or, you know, illegal uh, violation of, of, of antitrust laws, then one would argue that there would be more teams. And so then the question becomes, where would those teams exist? And so I did an economic analysis um, based on other work that I had done in uh, involving NBA teams, major league soccer teams. Um, sorry, my phone started talking Siri on my phone. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. <laughs> NBA teams, major league soccer teams. Um, and so I took uh, all this data uh, regarding the viability of different markets and applied it to open markets, applied it to NFL markets, and then used that information to apply it to open markets, Oakland being an open market now that the Raiders have moved. And lo and behold, the, um, the city of Oakland uh, was ranked as the highest market um, that, that doesn't have an NFL team now. And so again, the argument I think from the city side would be that, well, if there wasn't such a restriction of markets, the city of Oakland would have an NFL team. That's exactly what came up. Yeah. And that's what Mr. Simon was referring to uh, in his reference to the work that you had done uh, for that team. Uh, okay. What's your thoughts on, since we never really talked about it, what are your thoughts on the relocation? And oh, by the way, uh, a little bit of news for everybody out there. A third worker was diagnosed with COVID-19 that was reported uh, now 40 minutes ago by Miss Mitch A at the Las Vegas Review Journal. But mm -hmm. the thoughts on the re relocation and how it's- Jeez, no, that's, that's really uh, unfortunate with the with COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the relo you know, relocation is never, it always leaves a hole. It always leaves a market in the dust and there are unhappy fans and, you know, it really leaves a lot of scars in these markets. Now, um, you know, you move to Las Vegas and, and, and the state gives you $700 million. It's, it's, it's pretty hard to, to turn that down. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see how the Las Vegas market works out. It's done really well with the with the NHL team, um, and so you know, will the will the fans you know will it generate a lot of local fans, or will there be lots of fans who fly in from say Southern California, LA Raider fans, and the Bay Area Oakland Raider fans, and so forth? And will that be the big driver of ticket revenue? I think that's going to be an interesting question. Um, so I'm not a big fan of the relocation from the perspective of the scars that it leaves in the in you know in the marketplace where it left. But I do understand you know why an owner would do that simply because it's a lot easier to build a stadium with 700 million dollars than without. Hey, so it sort of allowed me to lead into the question I was going to ask, but in a different different angle. Uh, how does the coronavirus problem and the shelter in place change the economics with respect to sponsors in the stadium? I mean, they've got their sponsors in place, but they have to pay multi-year, like I think it was 20 million a year for uh, Allegiant Airlines for 20 years. But now, um, how, how would a sponsor respond to that? Is it are they taking themselves off the table or what generally happens? Or is this hard to say? Well, no, so it really depends on the contract. So all of these sponsorship contracts, you know, tend to have these, these um, stop, you know, stoppage of work sorts of clauses, an act of God clauses, um, you know, natural disaster clauses and things like that, where if, uh, you know, a game can't be played, usually the team will do a make good somehow. Now with the naming rights, it's a bit harder, um, you know, but, or if they can't do a make good, then often the you know the sponsor doesn't pay the full amount of revenue. And so I, I don't know what the contract looks like between the Raiders and their various sponsors. Um, but but I know in general that this issue is, is coming up, of course, you know, across the country in all these different sporting venues. And some of the sponsorship dollars are still flowing somewhat, and some of them aren't. Uh, teams and leagues are are kind of fighting to hold on to those, but at the same time, they. Um, mm-hmm. They have to be able to deliver the goods that they're promising, you know, with the sponsorship. And so I'll lead into the questions. Uh, talk about the USF program and how it and uh, your students are, are coping with the shelter in place policy in California. Yeah, I mean, so we at the University of San Francisco Sport Management Master's Program, um, we've been around since the early 1990s. And we are in San Francisco and in Orange County. And we have around 200 uh, students. And so each year we graduate about 100 students because it's a, it's a uh, two-year program. So we were coasting along, taking all these different classes and everything was going well, you know, come, come late February, early March. And then all of a sudden we were told by the university and obviously the state of California to start sheltering in place. And so we very quickly had to take our courses and put them online. Students had to go find, if some students went home to their home country, we have a fair number of international students, Mm. some to their home state, some of them stayed, Um, some of them are are, are, are from around here or from Southern California. So now that everybody got in place, now we're we're holding classes online using Zoom. Um, It's going, I mean, students have told us it's going pretty well. You know, it's not as exciting as being in the classroom, the energy level is different and everything. But we're, we're able to, to, you know, to cover the material and, and, and the students are doing their assignments and they're able to ask questions in class and so forth. We've been starting to hold these, these webinars, like Thursday lunches we've been having where we have guest speakers come in and talk about what's going on in, in, you know, in the sports industry and how they're, they're dealing with COVID-19. Um, our plan is to go live as soon as we're allowed to. So we bring in 70 new students uh, the week after July 4th. I don't know if we're going to be able to jump in the classroom or not. Um, I'm really hoping so. So we're, we're preparing ourselves to either have to go online or to be able to, to pivot and, and go live. Um, but, but overall, the students are doing well with, with, with the classroom. I'll tell you what's really happening, though, that's a real problem, is if you look at the data coming out of the Census Bureau, the sports industry and the leisure industry, hospitality, right? So, you know, restaurants and also retail, but the sports industry especially has had the largest drop in employment of about 30%. Oh my God. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So we have a ton of students who had jobs and internships, you know, early March and now they don't. 
And so they were struggling. And so, yeah, I mean, it's really been, it's really been difficult. And we as a program, um, you know, in fact, next week we're going to be coming out with our, our plan that we've been running past our deans and, and, and our vice provosts and everything on how we can help them as best we can. Uh, but it's really, that's, you know, the sports industry has really been hit hard, as you know, Zanny. I mean, you know, what we're talking about, I mean, you can't hold sporting events, which means lots of the workers are not needed, which means some teams are, are, are laying folks off or, or event owners are laying folks off. And so our students tend to be some of those people. So it's, it's really been unfortunate. Is that across the board or is it, I mean, is it fair to assume that, oh, this hasn't happened in the NFL yet or... You know, what does it look like? Because I know, for example, well, so the data, so I was looking at federal data. So it's it's literally just it's, it's it's all aggregated. So I you know I don't know except in talking with students, you know the teams have done a pretty good job of of holding on to their full time employees. Some people are taking pay cuts. The employees who tend to work hourly show up and work on game days and things like that, which some of our younger students do. And I say younger, I mean the students that are who came into the program in January, let's say. The ones who are already, you know, three quarters of the way through have, have tended to find themselves in, in, in jobs that, that haven't been um, subject to layoffs as much. Um, but I, it's all happening with event owners. So, you know, we've got students who work for event companies. And if there's no events, I mean, they really don't have any, any, any reason to hold on to these folks. So, um, you know, it's been real difficult. Uh, from your perspective, it seems like, from our, my, from our perspective, it seems like sports have just sort of stopped. Um, am I wrong? And, and what is the current financial condition of leagues as much as you know? In other words, are they completely broke? Right. Yeah, I know. Sports has stopped. Um, you know, you see it a little bit by NASCAR and, and, and the NBA and people, you know, they're playing video games online, which is, which is you know, interesting and engaging some fans. Um. And there's plans, as you know, Zenny, to maybe play the NBA, NBA playoff games in, in, in an empty arena, right? Sequester everyone, have them go through all the health protocol, and then kind of put them out there and play games. I don't know if that will happen or not, but it's certainly a plan that people are discussing. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the, the you know, different teams and leagues are struggling. Um, you know, their ticket revenue is gone. A chunk of their sponsorship revenue is, is stopped. Their concession revenue is gone. Merchandise revenue is still doing okay, right? Because fans are still buying merchandise. Um, their media revenues, I mean, a lot of the leagues are pushing the media um, where they're, they're basically trying to add on an extra year to a deal or something like that, where they're, they're trying to give the media some carrots so they can keep some of the, the money flowing. But you know, if they really are, are canceling entire seasons or the remainder of seasons, I, I, I don't think the media is going to, you know, going to keep paying that those full amounts. And so, you know, teams are able to save money. You know, teams aren't paying players as much, right? So, you know, a lot of the leagues have, have collective bargaining agreements where the players get a percentage of the revenue. And so as the revenue goes down, the players' pay goes down. They're saving money on travel. People are taking pay cuts. So the, so the teams are able to – you know, lower their budget somewhat, but the revenues is dropping faster than that. And so a lot of teams are upside down right now. And so it's really going to depend on the, on the pocket, the deep pockets of the owners to you know, sustain this and how fast everybody gets back to uh, playing again. I think you touched on it. We touched on it earlier, but it seems like there's now a forecast of 30% unemployment rate for the country. And yeah, when I, when I hear that, I think of companies – that are quite literally spiraling down, but is it right to or fair to think about it as as they spiral down, the revenue that sports organizations think they have from potential sponsors spirals down along with it? Yeah, I mean the way our economy works, of course, is it's all tied together, and so exactly if if a firm, you know, say, so financial services have done the best so far in terms of employment. Um, people are working at home. A lot of it's technologically driven, the relationships, you know, you can have a Zoom meeting, emails, you're logging onto your Schwab account or whatever it is. So that hasn't been hit as hard, but yet, of course, even those businesses, their customers are going are, are to be struggling. So there's, so there's going to be less money 
for those financial services firms. And then those financial services firms that are sponsoring sports teams or have luxury suites or whatever, just as you said, they're going to you know, start struggling too. So our economy is really tied together. I mean, you have the the Netflixes of the world and the Amazons, right? And I, I hear that, they're, that the, the, some of the grocery stores are, are booming, you know, in terms of their revenue. So there's a handful of industries that tend to do better when we sit at home, but 90, 95% of the industries do worse. And that's going to spread across all the industries, especially sports, which is a luxury good at the high end, you know, at the luxury suites, sponsorships, um, you know, season tickets, right? Premium seating, that, those are all luxury goods. And so th- those are going to get hit really hard um, as people get hit hard, you know. And uh, I would say uh, also two stadiums. Well, let me ask this another way. Because President Trump formed this multi-industry set of task forces, including sports. But can a bailout help? Is it? And if so, how much should it be? Right. So it's interesting. So I imagine um, that some of the smaller, you know, minor league teams, teams in in smaller leagues, um, they've been applying for the Paycheck Protection Program, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So have I. (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. (laughs) And so that's understandable. And so I think at that level, you know, those – those those uh, organizations will be helped out to the extent that they qualify and so forth. Um, but I do think that that at the you know at the major league level, right, the big four and so forth. Um, yeah, I imagine that you know they've got some some good lobbying power. I imagine that they're going to to be able to get some funding from the government, like many industries are. Um, you know, who knows how much, right? But I think. A lot of people see sports as as important in the sense that it'll help us feel normal again if we can watch sporting events or attend sporting events. And I think, you know, unlike 9-11, where it was very important that the Yankees uh, played, a, played a baseball game, right? And, you know, everybody stopped. And then as soon as they could get back on the field, it was really important that they played a baseball game. And that really started, you know, that made people – um, you know, that made people happier and more positive and so forth. And it kind of, we all, we all rallied around, you know, American pastime. Now, as we were just talking about earlier, probably sports is going to be the last thing to feel normal sports and going to concerts and things like that because of large gatherings of people are just not going to be the same for, I think, quite some time. And so certainly I think the leagues are going to be playing games on television, maybe in front of, of, of no audience. And then, you know, as soon as the audience can return, you'll have maybe, you know, one third full. Audience. I mean, Stanford university did that right before the, um, the, uh, you know, shelter at home and right before when basketball ended, they actually uh, hosted a couple of home games where they had one third, or at least they announced that they were going to, you know, they were going to have one third of the audience size to kind of spread people apart. So I could see it coming back that way, but then eventually, of course, filling those stadiums. So in that sense, the leagues and the teams and the sporting events are going to get hit harder for a longer period of time. And so I think that's going to be part of their pitch to the federal government, that, that they're really taking it on the chin, you know, more than most other industries, you know. Yeah. So we'll see what they get, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I know that uh, Governor Newsom just announced his business economic recovery task force, so uh, – I think there's somebody else sitting here should be on that panel. So, uh, <laughs> hey, Gavin, I'm going to send you another, uh, well, whatever, but this man. <laughs> uh, will there be an NFL season? Yeah, there will be an NFL season, and the NFL may push and push it back. You know, in other words, I think they would rather play in front of fans than not, but it's such a great sport for television that. They will play games, you know, without fans in the stadiums or without many fans in the stadium. Um, but they will be pushing those dates deep into the fall, wrapping around January into the spring if they have to. If you know, if they have to go all the way into the spring, I honestly think that they would rather do that than not play the season, you know, um, because all the revenue is involved. And yeah, it's gonna happen in college. I think college sports is the same way. They're gonna they're gonna try to kick off as soon as they can, but if those dates get pushed deep into the fall, I think they're just gonna keep pushing their calendar because I just think that's the best of all the you know of all the choices 
is to yeah. just move. You know, it's like the Olympics, right? It moved from July of 2020 to July of 2021, you know, presumably, if it, you know, and that's going to be the least amount of pain in, in terms of, uh, you know, everybody involved. You know, you also wrote earlier this week, I think, or at least was released earlier this week in Forbes that if there was no, if there were no college football season, if uh, the universities would lose out on billions in sponsorship revenue. Yes. Yeah? Um, yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know where that came out. I mean, we, I, I've had discussions with USA Today recently and ESPN and everything. Um, I don't know about billions in sponsorships, but probably if you add them all up, March Madness sponsorships are huge. All the bowl games and everything. You know, college football uh, is about a. I mean, college sports at the Division One level is about a fifteen billion dollar a year industry. That's that's the amount of revenue generated. So yeah, probably a billion of that is is sponsorship. And you know, they wouldn't lose all of that sponsorship revenue. I think they'll end up losing more ticket revenue. I think that's going to be the big hit for say college football um, and college basketball. But uh, but certainly sponsorship revenue will be hit too. Do you know if anyone's talked about new revenue sources? Here's why I asked that. I don't sort of slipped that question in, but it just occurred. Yeah. Uh, gambling, which the, the primary reason why Mark Davis sought Las Vegas as a as a future home for the Raiders, uh, a UNLV study that he got a hold of in 2015, seems like it could provide a great revenue source even for college sports and women's sports. If you're sheltered in place, you can still gamble on these events that you're watching, even if there's no audience, you know, in the room, right? Has right. anyone talked about that? I mean, I know DraftKings, which is more, yeah, you know, it's fantasy, but fantasy gambling. Um, you know, it its revenues haven't dropped as much. Uh, people are doing their casino games and things like that. I mean, I do. I, I think you're right. I think gambling is can, can kind of provide a counterbalance. Where just as you said, if, if they can play the games, people will find ways to to engage. You know, they will watch on television, but then they'll, they'll start gambling. And as you know, as as um, you know, now that we're allowed, now the different states are allowed to 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 offer gambling if they want to on sports. Many states have, have passed those laws, and so now I think that stuff's getting in place. It was just kind of getting going as a lot of this is happening. It takes a while to put those pieces into place. So, you know, I do imagine, and I, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how much. You know how much I haven't heard the focus of the leagues, teams, college sports on that. But I think you're right. I think that they that they need to really focus on that if they're looking for those revenue streams. I think everyone's being sensitive to, you know, um, the athletes themselves and the the workers themselves and and the fans and everything. So they're not talking as much about what's it going to look like in the future. But I, I agree with you that I think it will include higher gambling revenues. Yeah. And I was wondering maybe if we should accelerate, I know Gavin Newsom signed this in the law, the ability of college players to make money from their likeness, because I think of the number of college players that, of course, CrossFit's coming up, and these folks are all over Instagram, man. And I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, cash cow, cash cow, cash cow. But someone needs to allow them to make the connection, because they're of that age, and right. they're literally putting themselves out there, right? And yeah. I'm I'm wondering if anybody has said, hey, you know what? Maybe maybe that's a future for you all. Yeah, that, that's interesting because as you know, the law in California was was purposefully set to not begin until 2023. Right. To basically give the NCAA a time to react to it and kind of get its own house in order. Um, other states have passed laws. Uh, Florida is is close to passing a law that, that would have a date that starts, I think, next, uh, I think about a year from now, so so much sooner. But as you know, the NCAA also, and they they, they were going to come out with something this week, maybe next week, kind of their, their plan going forward. So I do think the athletes will be allowed to earn money from their name, image, and likeness in the near future, before 2023 even. Um, and as you said, they're coming out of high school much more, you know, media savvy than, 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 than back in the day. And they already have a following on social media so they can, you know, instantly start to monetize their right of publicity online. And then of course, as we get back in, in you know, out in, you know, out into the open and we're, and we're not social distancing, then they can start to do more traditional endorsements and things like that. Yeah. It's, it's a great revenue stream that's untapped. There was a study 
done by CLC. Mm -hmm. Because when I was testifying in the O'Bannon case, that that this came up in discovery, that they said that there's probably about a billion and a half to $2 billion of money being left on the table. People can't buy athlete centric um, merchandise, right? Like, you know, if you want to buy the quarterback's jersey with the name on the back while they're the quarterback in college, today you can't do that. You have to wait till they're done with their eligibility. But of course, that's what people want to buy. And so there's a lot of money not being spent. So fans would be better off because they can buy those the, those items. But then so would the players getting their royalty. And so would the schools getting their royalty. And so would the manufacturing companies, right? Everybody. So I'm with you on that. I think I think it's a it's a way to kind of benefit everyone if the NCAA can kind of get going faster and get this thing off the ground. Yeah. You, you touched on something that kind of was in my face when Antonio Brown came to the Raiders and they put him on hard knocks training camp with the uh, the Las Vegas Raiders or uh, Oakland Raiders at the time. Yeah. And um, I'm so confused, man. And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to be like. I'm going to keep calling the Oakland Raiders. It's going to take a while for me to find Yeah, them. I just – it's like they're always the Oakland Raiders. Like, I, you know, I was, I was I was widely toying with the idea of taking a Photoshop of the stadium in in Las Vegas and putting it <laughs> in Oakland. Putting it in Oakland, right, right. Yeah, just for just, just kicks, right? But anyway, <laughs> uh, it occurred to me that Antonio Brown commands in terms of merchandise sales – enough over a year to your period to pay for his contract. And I'm wondering why NFL players, not players, and maybe the, the NFL PA, and I'm happy to be wrong if I am, I'm asking the question, don't pitch the the merchandise value of their players to teams. I know Brady, you know, is certainly going to help, but the Buccaneers it already has. But I'm surprised there isn't more of a, a focus on where these players are as, as values in a stock market with respect to merchandise sales, right? And where we have a constant tab on them. And you can, and then if a, if a player like Antonio Brown is cut from either the Raiders or the Patriots, and I'm, I'm not saying for Patriots, it was that whole moral thing, which puts a different spin on it, which I get. But prior to that, it was, it was just that he was, you know, he was erratic. But if you know that, would it cause would it cause organizations to treat players differently? Are we are we not seeing the true value of athletes with respect, particularly in the NFL, with respect to their teams? No, that's interesting. I mean, so teams are aware of which players sell the most jerseys, right? That's that's known to the teams, um, and the players get a cut of those royalties. Uh, the NFLPA does, and the teams do, of course, because those are those are joint products. You have the players' right of publicity, and you have the teams' right of publicity, and they put them together. The player, you know, on the you know, you know, wearing the jersey. Um, what I do think, though, um, ends up being an issue is that is that a lot of those merchandise revenues are shared across teams. So, in other words, oh. if, the, if the Raiders sell merchandise in the Raiders stores within a certain, you know, footprint of the stadium, then the Raiders get to keep the bulk of the, of the profits from those. But, but like if I go on fanatics and I buy a Raiders Jersey, um, you know, and it shipped to me from wherever that tends to be equally shared revenue across the league as part of the revenue sharing rule. So there's less of, so there's less to gain by, by getting a guy hoping that you're going to make money off of sales of their Jersey. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, I sure do. But in in that said, then basically, um, is it that even if that's the case, should teams think even more differently? Because I, here's why I say that, and here's why I keep belaboring the point: when Terrell Owens was with the Cowboys, and the media was really focusing on his quote antics. Mm -hmm. I searched his name, the Cowboys did have number one position. And I'm thinking, God, that's web revenue they're losing out on. So I'm I'm just, you know, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering just how well even the teams understand their players as a market unto themselves and uh, 
that can really even deliver more franchise value to a team. And I'm wondering if they had a full understanding, not just understanding, but able um, ability to um, take take advantage of it. Okay. Right. Right. If, if they would, if they would, if they were to treat their players differently than they do. So again, that tends to be the case outside of football of, of the NFL. Yeah. The NFL has such strong revenue sharing rules where like most of the revenue other than certain stadium revenues are, are part of that revenue sharing pool. It's hard for a team to kind of justify, you know, even TV ratings, like imagine, you know, Tampa, right. Tom Brady goes to Tampa. Mm -hmm. People are going to watch uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers games than they have in the past. And yet the bucks are not going to see that money. They'll see some of the radio revenue from that, but the TV revenue, as you know, is equally shared on a national basis. Pete, Pete Rozelle um, put that in place back in the 1960s, right? Um, you know, as, as a way to to have the New York Giants basically help some of the smaller market teams stay alive and, and grow. Yeah. The and so, you know, NBA, sure, Major League Baseball, yeah, that's more. You know, that's that's more the case. But with the NFL, just those revenues kind of get lumped into the big pool. And so it's it's harder for teams to monetize that individual star. But I suppose doing that, by doing that, the league avoids what ultimately brought it into, I believe it was the first professional soccer league where they had Magic Jack. And that fellow had all these wild deals, but nobody else had any money. I forgot the owner's name. So I guess. Oh, right. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that. And I, I, as I as I hear you, and I think about the situation, it seems like a, a six of one and half a dozen of the other situation. In other words, if you have you have to have revenue share, uh, but if you don't have it, then you can have this imbalance that ends that that supposedly I would think leads to a team's uh, or a league's uh, demise. And uh, and having said that, though. What do you see as a future for Major League Soccer? I've talked about a lot about the NF and the um, the NFL, but Arthur Blank owns the uh, Atlanta Atlanta United, which I gotta say, Dan, I have never, I never thought that soccer could be so popular in a city. They draw seventy thousand for games here. I know, no, it's an amazing, wow, you know, it's an amazing launch of a of a you know, you know, everyone talked about the Seattle Sounders as being really the best launch of, a, of, of an expansion team in kind of the history of sports. And then Atlanta came along and basically even blew Seattle out of the water. Um, yeah, no. So Major League Soccer is interesting, too, because it's a single Delaware LLC. It's a single oh. company. A single company owns all the leagues, I mean, all the teams and the marks and contracts with the players at the league level. And then they have a thing called Soccer Night Marketing that they spun off that's also an LLC in Delaware, and that does all their media and sponsorships and everything at, at the national level. So, so like, the, like it, the first XFL, right, in a sense? Yeah, kind of like that, yeah. And so when they – when you – when you you know, essentially what we call buy a franchise or launch a franchise in Major League Soccer, what you're really doing is you're buying shares of that LLC, that, that private company, and then you're giving the rights to operate a team – in whatever the market is, and then you get to keep a certain percentage of this revenue and that revenue stream and so forth. And so Major League Soccer has, over the years, allowed the owner, you know, they call them owner operators, allowed the owners at that, you know, at the team level to, to keep more and more of their revenue. In the early days, they were, they were really having to send a lot of that, they didn't, didn't make a lot of revenue, but they were sending it to the league office and everything. Um, but now they get to keep more of it. So when Atlanta signs a star soccer player, right, they're able to keep more of those revenues that are generated from that than, say, the NFL. Even though the NFL is independently owned teams in the league and, and, and Atlanta is just part of a single company. You know, so, so, so out of all the leagues, the NFL is the one that has the most revenue sharing. And, and so that helps the smaller market teams because it, it, it drives revenue for, you know, to them. But it also causes what Jerry Jones kind of says is that, that socialism problem, you know, in, in, in the NFL because owners don't have much of an incentive to market their teams and to try to make their teams better because they don't get to, to keep all of the fruits of those successes. They basically have to share all that stuff, right? Yeah. So myself included in some, some research I've published that, 
Hmm. In some ways, there's too much revenue sharing in the NFL. Um, it, it would be better if there was enough to kind of keep those small market teams hitting that team salary minimum, but not additional amounts that are essentially coming from the Cowboys and some of the larger market teams, you know. That's interesting because, I mean, I'm thinking of Jerry Jones having established, uh, and this is something I think you guys are talking about off camera regarding uh, the case, the Raiders case. Right. But to make a, a quick one, and then Phenom's got a question on the floor here. But hey, Phenom, how you doing? He's one of our regular viewers. But at any rate, um, Jerry Jones established legends. There is an argument advanced by Seth Worsham at ESPN through his research for his uh, report on how the Las Vegas Raiders came to be, essentially, that Jones advocated for its for the um, relocation of the Raiders and gave a sale point, a sales point to the rest of the owners. I mean, I can say from my own experience that I can vouch for that because on Zenny 62 on YouTube here, if you type John Clayton from ESPN, you'll see a video of John at SFO Airport telling me that Jerry Jones had lined up the votes already. We were on our way to Phoenix for what became the vote that sent the Raiders to Las Vegas. So, uh, but my point is, it seems like Jerry is finding these different revenue streams for himself. He told me that he expected the Cowboys to be worth $10 billion in about uh, 10, five to 10 years uh, yeah. because of gambling. But is he on his own then through his own entrepreneurship sort of, you know, bending the envelope anyway? And so, yeah, you know, he is. And he's, you know, it's funny because people have called him a maverick owner, but, but really why they say that is that he's trying to grow his team's brand himself and not necessarily the league's brand. He's not against the league's brand, but he doesn't think, he thinks the owners are sitting on their hands too much. And so he has been able to, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the revenue that's not shared is stadium specific revenue because they, they want to give owners an incentive to spend money to build new stadiums. And so they say, you, you know, you can keep a lot of that revenue. So his stadium generates a, a ton of revenue compared to other stadiums, but he's also been able to, to have sponsorships of the Dallas Cowboys that were actually in conflict with some of the NFL sponsors. Mm -hmm. and, they fought, and, and, and they fought over that. And then he had, he has kind of a carve out in the collective bargaining agreement that basically allows those sorts of things. So he, he, you know, his team does generate a lot more revenue than most of the other NFL teams. So, so again, it's not all 100% shared. It's not like everybody makes the same revenue, right? But, but you know, that national media deal, he, he, he does only get the same amount, but in a lot of the other revenue streams, he's able to push that envelope harder. And so, yeah, he's, he, he's really done that. And so, you know, why would he have lined up Vegas? I mean, that's a question I haven't thought about. Um, maybe partly because if he saw the $700 million of public money, he figured the, the, the Raiders would, would you know generate more revenue overall for the league um, because they would have a better stadium than they have you know in Oakland. Um, maybe he thought the media money would be better. Maybe he thought somehow the gambling or the you know the gambling on the NFL would would increase with having a team in Las Vegas. You know, I mean, that's a I think that's a really interesting question to try to think about no. why why, you know, why did he do it? There's something we might be able to collaborate on informationally because I remember the league referring to a need to have a minimum local revenue take annually of 25 million. And it's, you know, I, I did, I wasn't able to read more about that or understand where that came from and where it was, but it seemed to drive the push originally for the Raiders to move in with uh, the Niners. And then I remember Jed told me that Jed York, the owner of the 49ers told me that, Mark didn't like the color of the seats or something like that. Yeah, uh, they're all red. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're red, you know, but it didn't happen. And then, of course, you have the Giants in the Meadowlands but with the uh, the Jets uh, right. and, yeah, now the Chargers and the Rams. But right. it, it would seem to me, do you think maybe it's that that that, that attempt to, to – basically he's saying that, hey, in the Bay Area, we can't make that. But in Las Vegas, it gives us a finding chance. And if that's the case, then this whole coronavirus problem really wrecks that, huh? 
I mean, the corona, so the coronavirus issue, right? I mean, I you know, I think the Raiders were going to open the stadium, you know, in August, right, for this coming season, and I think SoFi was going to open up in July, you know, twenty third, whatever, and then they were going to start the football season. What? Taylor Swift, July twenty third, Taylor Swift. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so there you go. Because so, I wanted to go to the concert. That's why. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, right? I mean, and so even though the workers are still working, as you said, if there's a third person with with COVID nineteen helping to build the Raiders Stadium, you got to think at some point they're they're going to have to cut down the number of workers and have them social distance. It, you know, I mean, I, I, they're going to fight hard not to stop construction, but so I, I think there's going to be delays in. Those stadiums opening, which means probably the Rams are playing at the LA Coliseum for for however many games until they move in. Probably the Raiders are playing at at uh, UNLV Stadium. I mean, you know, they have to do a deal, but but presume you know, I just don't think that they're going to be to to be able to open those. Now, if the NFL season gets delayed deep into the fall, then maybe these guys are able to finish those um, those stadiums. You know, it, it occurred to me because this happened in the NBA. When the Sacramento Kings were going to move to Seattle, they had basically been sold to the hedge fund manager from San Francisco, whose whose name's escaping me. And um, and there was a, yeah, you know, I, 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 you're talking about yeah, uh, yeah. And there was a clause that basically, of course, if the NBA didn't allow the team to move, then this person wasn't going to buy the team. And um, part of the incentive for the owners, because in Seattle they the the the, the um, he was going to pay for the whole arena. So that sounds good from a fan perspective, from a community perspective, right? Instead of having public money go into that. Well, the, the NBA owners don't like that precedent, right? They don't like it when an owner 100% privately finances an arena because then it puts pressure on all of the other owners to do the same thing. And so Jerry Jones, part of his incentive could have been, look, here's $700 million in in Las Vegas of public money. And here's some amount in Oakland, you know, who knows what that number was ever going to be, but it wasn't going to be that high at all. And so maybe Jerry's like, look, we should let the teams move to the markets that get the largest amount of public money because that keeps that ball rolling all over the country, you know, for better or worse, right? But so by the way, Vim, Vim and Nick, why, why he was in that. There you go. Yeah. That's the King's owner. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? What? Who now? Viv, uh, Vivek Ronnie, yeah, no, so he's the current Kings owner, yeah, yeah, but he, he, the team was actually sold briefly, uh, with one with that clause to a hedge fund manager from San Francisco who was oh. going to move the team to Seattle. Oh, and, but of course, he, he only wanted to buy the team if the NBA approved the relocation. If you remember, the NBA oh, blocked them, right? right. Yeah, Kevin Johnson, the, the you know the Hall of Fame basketball player, who happened to be the mayor of Sacramento at the time. He was able to convince the NBA to let him go out and find another ownership group, which which he was able to do and basically keep the team in Sacramento. But part of that was that in Sacramento they were going to get public money, which they did. In Seattle, it was going to be 100 percent finance, and the other owners don't again want to set that precedent by by having these privately financed. Now the Warriors do a privately financed arena. Because guess what? In the Bay Area, it's really hard to get that that public money, um, you know, for, for you know for an arena or football stadium and, and, and so forth. You know, we see the 49ers playing in a billion dollar stadium where they you know where they got 10, 15 percent of that was public and the rest was was private money. You know. Hey, before I get to Phenom, do you think the A's can snare that kind of sponsorship money with at Howard Terminal? Uh, if it built at Howard Terminal, which I, you know the governor signed into law a um, do you realize that Governor Newsom signed in the law, uh, uh, Dan, October 11th, the last year, a tax increment financing zone that would net a billion dollars in subsidy, 1.4 billion, assuming that the base year assessed value included the baseball stadium, let's say 1.5 billion, and then the properties behind it at 500 million, that's $2 billion. If that increases at a four four year bond issue at uh, just four percent annually, that's one point mm. four billion dollars. That's mm. double what the Raiders got to move. <laughs> right. You know, I was like, I was like crazy. Uh, but hey, by the way, Phenom has a question. Phenom says, uh, "What do you guys think about Governor Newsom's?" Uh, this is a great question. Governor Newsom's decree 
that sports won't return to California until November at the earliest. Your thoughts? Oh, I can see comments now. Okay. <laughs> I just hit <laughs> the right button. Um, I mean, he would know better than us, right? I mean, I think that, as we talked about before, Phenom, the I think sports is going to be somewhat last to return, or at least last to return with, with fans in the stands, compared to, um, you know, people going back to work and, and retail stores opening with some sort of potential social distancing process in place. Um, so that's, you know, if it really is going to be November, that's going to hit – uh, you know, that's going to hit the NFL and college, college, you know, all those fall college sports. And I don't know how the NBA is going to finish their season this year when basically November would be their season, the beginning of the season next year. So if that's the case, um, you know, it's, it's, I think you're going to end up having a lot of seasons being played next spring. I mean, you know, I mean, imagine, or deep in the fall, you're going to have the NBA season finishing up maybe this year. And then they start the new one, you know, a month later, um, you know, things like that are going to be happening. I think the leagues are going to be willing to be creative, though. And, you know, the NBA had, had basically floated the idea. I mean, they basically put the idea in place that they were going to have kind of a midseason tournament. I mean, think how crazy that is compared to what we've always had. With the so I think these owners are, are and these league leaders are are creative and they see this is a, this is a chance to kind of do various things that, that maybe would be looked upon in a strange way, um, you know, in the past. Hey, so uh, out of respect for your time, because we got, I'm going to start winding it down. Um, although, like, we talk for another hour. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm talking about this stuff all day. In fact, I have, a, I have a call with students right after this to talk about some of these issues. So, there you go. <laughs> How can people follow your work? Uh, and because I know you've got, particularly now, and I, I imagine you're going to be even busier with what's happening. But how can people follow your work? Uh, and where can they go to get your studies uh, if they want to, you know, I can put the, the link here or below. Where, where, where should they go? That's a good question. I mean, I, I'm a little active on Twitter. That seems to be, I don't do anything on Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or any of those things. Um, when, when I do publish something new, um, I usually put something up on Twitter. So that's one, one way to keep track of what's going on. Um, I'm happy to send use any, any, of any, hey, of can you, Hey Dan, can you repeat that? Because somehow, this got, I don't know, uh, sometimes it happens with StreamYard. It's the only thing. It gets a little hesitant. Sure. So repeat yeah, that no, one more time. So Twitter is the place where I, I tend to be uh, on social media, you know, really nowhere else. And so I, I'll, I'll post when I have a new article uh, that's come out on, on Twitter. Um, the consulting I do, a lot of it ends up being private. So mm -hmm. it's not publicly available, although sometimes it is. Um you know, people can email me at my company, Sports Economics, at sportseconomics.com. They can email me at OSKR. They can email me at the University of San Francisco. I'm always happy to share stuff. I do it, I would say, four or five times a week, a stranger reaches out and they want to read something. So I'm, I'm always happy to send it to them. So, so you know, it's always it, it, do it. It occurs to me, maybe, that it, it might be that I had a page up for you at uh, the old sports business simulation site. Um, that I could post as well because I think some of your links were there. Uh, dot com. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. The uh, the site's still active, even though I just typed the uh, old. Yeah. So sports uh, folks, at the end of this, out of respect for Dan's time, because he's got to get going, I'll post our old page because the act the site is still active. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. I, I kept it going, like you know, for for reasons of of, of pride and ego. <laughs> <laughs> hey Dan, this has been great, man. We're gonna have you back. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, man, it, it, this has been super fun. We once we're back outside of our houses, we need to get together and have a beer or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's definitely yeah. Hey, stick around. Uh hey folks, uh we'll be back. We have at seven o'clock uh Pacific and then ten o'clock my time, we actually have uh, an NFL draft player that uh, we're introducing um, who uh, is uh, uh, was going to talk to us about about uh, his uh, his his uh, attributes and why he's going to be a great NFL draft player and uh, stay tuned because frankly speaking folks you're saying why don't I name the name this just got dropped into my lap. <laughs> So it's, it's more like a, a, a person as opposed to a name. 
And I um, I'm looking around. Oh, here it is. I yeah. Um, Christian Boogie Cavaness, running back out of Bethany College, West Virginia, will be our guest. Seven o'clock Pacific, ten o'clock Eastern. Again, his name is Christian Cavaness. Christian Boogie Cavaness. So join us. And then, uh, you know, hey, enjoy all the content we've got. With Murderers Row. We had Raiders. Lee Steinberg, who says hello, by the way. And then Mr. Rasher, Professor Rasher, um, shooting par, actually above par today, below par, <laughs> below par, not above. Par. <laughs> hey, Derek, it's been great. Thanks, man. Oh, all right, I'll take care. Stick around, okay. hey, folks. We'll okay. Be- all right, all right. Um, ending of broadcast. All right, cool. <laughs>